He's got the whole world in his hands. Worldwide Communion Sunday. Amy, thank you for reading that scripture for us this morning out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. By the way, there is no new version live event today. I'm looking at it. Time just got away and we were able to get that up for you this morning. Um, we've done really well with that, though. I think every Sunday since the first of the year we've had it, uh, at least when I'm here. Uh, so apologies for that not being here today. So, you just have to be like the rest of us to follow uh, along with what I share. We are the body of Jesus Christ. I wonder what that means. What that means to you. What, what comes to mind when you think about the fact that you are the body of Jesus Christ. Well, today the body of Jesus Christ is sitting down at the table together. How cool is that? You say, well, we do that every first Sunday of the month. No, 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 no. Not just this part of the body of Christ, but the entire body. Throughout the entire world. The theory is, or the idea is that over the next 24 hours, everybody who is a Christian will partake of communion. Now, does it work perfectly? No. Why? Because not everybody knows about it. I was just uh, at two events this last week in Post Falls, which is up near Port Lane. Uh, first was the Leadership Tune-Up Conference, where pastors and church leaders come together to learn great things. And then following that was the um, mentor training. I'm a mentor for our other local ABC pastor service, part-time reaching staff to do that. And so during those two events, I did everything I could to let other pastors know and to encourage them to, uh, on this Sunday, at the very least, with Lake Notice, let their congregation know that they're participating in World Life Communion Sunday. Started a lot of years ago. In fact, I've been a Christian for 39 years now. And every first Sunday of October of my Christian life, I have celebrated Worldwide Communion Sunday. Whether you know it or not, if you've been here for six years, you've participated in it for six years, at least. Here's what's happening. It used to be a big deal. And I believe what's happening is sort of the... Uh, the, the fizzling of denominations, because there were denominations that gave it a big emphasis, but denominationalism isn't as important or as big a deal as it was uh, 30 years ago. Uh, and because there are so many independent churches, they don't have a clue, they don't know about it, uh, so they don't celebrate. So, I am on a quest, speaking of Mano Bolomacha, I am on a quest to put myself and to have our church promote <laughs> Worldwide Communion Sunday is to spread the word so that year after year more and more Christians so that that beautiful idea of the entire body of Christ once a year. Let me ask, what does the entire body of Christ ever do together? This side of heaven. What do we do together? There's nothing that we do together. This would be one thing that we say, look, I'm a Christian here, I'm a Christian there, and we're a Christian everywhere. We are sit down together. Do you remember Hands Across America? How many of you participated in Hands Across America about 20 years ago? Are you serious? There more in your where, where the idea was, we're going to join hands all the way across the country, right? And so on that particular Saturday, you went out, and, and they told you what streets to go on, and other people there, and you joined hands, and we're, we're going to join from the East Coast to the West Coast. Did it work? Uh, Close. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't have gotten hands across, you know, 20 feet. I think there were about 10 of us where we went and stood, and 100 yards, or a couple hundred yards down, there were about five more people, and now that way you can see a few people, but uh, it just, it didn't. But for us, the bread of life across the world, the wine across the world, is happening today, even though everybody is a, a large part of the body of Christ is celebrating this today. Well, I want us to look at the text. I talked to you a little bit last week about eisegesis and exegesis. A couple words that sound vague, but they really are. Eisegesis is where we read into the scripture and we say what we want it to say. Exegesis is looking at the scripture and taking out of what the Spirit wants to say, what, what the Spirit wants us to learn. So we're going to do some exegesis this morning. 
We're going we're to take some things out of the scripture and see what God has to say to us. Just before we do that, let me ask another question. Can you imagine Teddy Snow right now? Teddy, wave your hands, get people up. Can you imagine Teddy Snow, friendliest person around, right? Just so wonderful, just always smiling and just so happy and always greeting people. Could you imagine Teddy getting up right now? Going back to the table. In fact, what's the table doing back there? Did you notice when you came in that the community table was not in the same short itself? You think about what that might mean. Back in the prior, I've been thinking, why in the world is that? So you think about that. I'll give you my interpretation. This may not be the best one. Yours might be better. You think about that, why it might be out there. I'll, I'll see my view later. But imagine if Teddy got up right now and went out there and ate all the bread and drank all the juice. <laughs> How would you feel about Teddy? <laughs> what would you think about Teddy? Because then when we go to take communion, there's nothing left. Teddy, you wouldn't do that, would you? You, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. Of course you wouldn't. But that's what was taking place in the church in Corinth. There were people getting to the Lord's Supper, and those who got there first ate up all of the food, all of the elements, and there wasn't enough left for everybody else. And so Paul is writing to the Corinthian church in response to that taking place. He basically says, hey, eat supper before you come. <laughs> Don't expect us to feed you a meal there. This is, this is a spiritual thing taking place. Not, we're not feeding you physically. You know, you're going to have a little bit, but, but it's not about that. And so that's why Paul is writing what he's writing. And what's great about when he writes this is that he gives us a description of what the Lord's Supper is. And as we get to it, too, I, uh, I've shared with you before, but it bears repeating, I think, that there are three basic views of the Lord's Supper and what it means. One is the Catholic view, and that's called transubstantiation, where the belief is that the bread and the wine literally become, when the priest gives the blessing, they literally become the bread, or the body, and the blood of Jesus Christ. So when you partake of it, you're doing what it sounds like saying in Scripture, you're partaking of his body and his blood. But then it's actually his body and his blood. Then there is, if you get down to Luther's consubstantiation, I say down because Catholics we call high church, Baptists we call low church. And there's a whole lot in between, right? Um, and that's based on view and ritual and all those kind of things. Um, but there's consubstantiation, which is where it doesn't literally become the body and the blood of Christ, but where the real presence, you may have heard that before, where the real presence of Christ is, is basically infused into the bread and the wine. So it's not really his body and blood, but, but he is really present in those elements. Then you get to the Baptist and a whole lot of others who see it as simple. That the sacred part of partaking of this meal is what takes place in the person, not in the elements. They are there to remind us of what Jesus did for us. And so the cleansing of sin isn't by those elements, it's by Jesus, but those elements help remind us of who Jesus is and what he did for us. And so the sacred thing takes place in you, not in what's on the table. It's just there to remind us. Does that make sense? Um, I, I don't know what your view is, but that's a, a typical Baptist view, and again, a lot, a whole lot of others um, that see communion that way. Well, let's see what the Scripture says. First Corinthians chapter eleven, verse twenty-three: For I received from the Lord. This is Paul talking to the church of Corinth. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. Let's stop there. Let's start with the first couple words. For I, Paul says I, it's an emphatic I, not anyone else. I'm going to share with you what I know, what I've experienced, what I've learned. I'm going to share that with you. For I received from the Lord. Now, how did Paul receive this from the Lord? For I received from the Lord what I'm going to pass on to you. For I received it from Jesus himself. Did he have another time where he had this physical experience like he did on the road to Damascus in Acts 9? 
where he saw Jesus and he heard Jesus. He talks about himself being kind of an apostle out of time and he came along late, but did Jesus still reveal himself to him? So did Jesus come and reveal himself again and say, okay, here's what the Lord's Supper is all about? No. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. Received of the Lord is by immediate revelation from the risen Savior. Galatians 1.12, this is Paul again. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 22, this is about Paul. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking. Quick, he said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately because they will not accept your testimony about it. 2 Corinthians 12. I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. So, Paul received revelations from the Lord. I wonder how many of us, whenever anybody says, the Lord told me that we're skeptical of what they're about to say. Yes. Okay. Most of us are. Not all of us, but most of us are. Especially when this person says, the Lord told me, and this person next to them says, the Lord told me, and those two things can't go together. I mean, yesterday, the Lord told me that Ohio State was going to win, and somebody else would have said, the Lord told me that Northwestern is going to win. Yes, the Lord told me correctly. Barely. The score shows a little more than barely with that last play, right? Um, but, the, but there are revelations from the Lord. And there are those who get that. Now, we need to test the spirits here in our day. But we can trust because the Holy Scripture is inspired, God-breathed by the Spirit of God, that what is said is true. And so Paul received these revelations. And so God revealed to him this thing about the Lord's Supper. Now, what's cool about that to me is that gives it even greater value. Jesus gives us the Lord's Supper with the disciples, right? His last supper, he institutes this. And the disciples are doing it, because obviously they're doing it into to Paul's time here, right? But the fact that he says, it was revealed to me by the Lord, just gives it another stamp right on it. It says, this is important. This is something that's supposed to continue. I received it from the Lord by immediate revelation. And then it goes on to say, um, on the night he was betrayed. On the night. So Passover takes place at night. You realize that? Passover is, the Passover meal is supposed to take place at night. Exodus chapter 12. The animals you choose must be your old males without defect. You may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, even the day is specified. When all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. So you slaughter them at twilight going into night and you partake of it at night. Then they're to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops and the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. And that's where the Passover takes place. The death angel passes over. Now notice there's a time fixed, a day and a time fixed for Passover which is where the Lord's Supper gets instituted, but nowhere does it say a specific time or day that the Lord's Supper needs to be taken. So for the Lord's Supper, there's not a fixed time. On the night that he was betrayed, Judas the traitor was at the table. Judas was about to leave and lead the Roman soldiers to where Jesus would be so they could arrest him and crucify him. Jesus not only did not stop Judas, but he said to Judas, what you're going to do, do quickly. Jesus knew what was about to happen. And he said, go ahead, bring it on. That's why I came. And because Jesus had the whole world in his heart. At that moment, when, G when Judas dipped in the sauce, Jesus identified him as the traitor. At that moment, Jesus had the whole world in his heart, but he knew that within a very short time, he literally was going to have the sin of the world in his hands. 
Verse 24. And when he had given thanks, he broke the bread. He said, this is my body, which is for you. There's proof for us that it's not a literal body. Because Jesus was there present, and he took bread and broke it. And said, this is given for you. He didn't start taking off pieces of his flesh. He said, this bread. So he, he meant as a symbol of his body. He, he couldn't have given his body physically to them at that moment, or at least he chose not to. And so he set it up for us as a symbol. He'd given thanks, he broke it, he said, this is my body, which is for you, or Luke extends a little bit, Luke 22, 19, this is my body given for you. He willingly gives it, he volunteers to give it. It's broken in pieces. I, I break this bread, which means what? Distribution. You know, when you say pass the bread and there's a loaf of bread sitting there, it's one piece and they give to you. But Jesus said, no, I'm going to break it, which means I'm, I'm, I'm making enough pieces for all of you to have. It's broken for everyone who will partake of it. You don't have to partake of it. Have you ever tried to give somebody something and they didn't want it? Just a few minutes ago, somebody told me I tried to give somebody something they didn't want. It. Something really else. Didn't want it. It's okay. You know, Jesus doesn't force himself, but he broke it for everyone. He offers it to everyone, but not everyone takes what he is given. My body is given for you. As the bread is to your bodily health, so his body is to the believing community's spiritual health. Verse 25. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, Okay? So the Passover meal, the meal itself, the supper part, is complete. After supper, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The new covenant. The cup is the parchment deed on which his new covenant, or his last will, is given to us. So it's not just about then, but it's about future. He's giving us our inheritance a forgiveness of sins. He's showing his grace and mercy and washing our sin away so that our future is one of righteousness of living the way that he desired for us to live. It's the cup of the new covenant in my blood. We're ratified by his blood. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, Jesus. But he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. Then it says, whenever you drink it, as many times so ever, for it's important as, as often as you partake of it. Again, it doesn't say how often we should take it. It doesn't say where we should take it. It doesn't say what time we should take it. But what it does say is you're going to take it more than once. Whenever you partake of it, whenever you do it, do this in remembrance of me. So it is something supposed to be going on. Unlike baptism, baptism is supposed to be a one-time deal. We are baptized as our initiation, showing that we are born again, born into this new kingdom, and our sins are all washed away, we're cleansed. Doggone it. Have any of you who have been baptized and all of your sins have been washed away, have you ever sinned again? <laughs> I'm just saying. Can I get away this? Right? Okay. <laughs> so we need this sanctifying work, this re-cleansing to go on, and so... Communion is, is that symbol of that. It reminds us that we need, we still need Jesus to keep working in us. We are not yet perfected, right? We are being perfected. That root of sin has been pulled out, but for some reason we step, keep stepping back into that junk, that muck and that mire. And we need that cleaned off. We need our feet cleaned off, don't we? Oh, what? Oh, oh. <clears throat> what happened at the Lord's Supper? They were sitting at the table. Jesus got up and got a basin of water and a towel, and he washed their what? Their feet. But Peter said, well, oh, finally, no, you can't do that, Lord. He says, yes, I have to do it. You're not part of me. Well, then, wash what? All of me. No, you don't need all of you. Only your feet are dirty. In other words, you've been cleansed by baptism. Yes? Only your feet are dirty. I'll just wash those. You've you still got some things we need to work on. And so communion helps remind us that in remembrance of me, Luke expresses this. Matthew and Mark understand it. Paul twice records it in remembrance of me. 
The sacrifices brought sins continually to remembrance. Hebrews chapter 10. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeatedly, endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. The Lord's Supper brings to remembrance Christ's sacrifice once and for all whole and final remission of sins. It is not, he does not say, make this a memorial of me, set this up as a shrine, and, and let it be about me. He says, do this in remembrance of me is about us. Is about us remembering what he's done for us. Because we forget. We, we have bad short-term memory, don't we? We forget that Jesus loves us so much that he died for us. We forget that Jesus wants to bless us beyond measure with grace and that he gives us things we don't deserve. We forget that Jesus is so full of mercy that every time we sin, he doesn't want to punish us for the things we've done. He shows mercy. We throw ourselves in the mercy of the court. But we're forgiven only if we do that. Only if we come to him. And only by his blood. Does that happen? Is that possible? And communion reminds us of that. Last verse, 26. For whenever you eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Proclaim, announce publicly. Public, we profess, each one of you, that the Lord died for me. When you partake of this, you say, the Lord died for me. Realizing that we ourselves are members of his body. Our simple bodies made one with his body. Our souls washed through his precious blood. Proclaim also applies to things new. It's not just about now. It's about who I am into the future. That I am a cleansed child of God. So the Lord's death and all the saving blessings resulting from it ought always be brought to our memory. And then finally, until he comes. Proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Where there shall no longer be any need for symbols. Till he comes. We don't need the symbols anymore. The body itself is manifested. Jesus is present. The Greek expresses the certainty of his coming. The showbread in the temple Literally, the bread of presence was in the sanctuary, not in the holy place. So the Lord's Supper shall be superseded in heaven. That is the holiest place. This just gives us a foretaste. Instituting the Last Supper, Jesus shows that he was about to do, what he was about to do was for the whole world. John 3, 16, anybody know it? Say it with me. For God so loved the world. Let's stop there. God's love of what? He loved the earth? No. He loved the people. Time past, time present, time future. For God's so love of the world that he sent Jesus. So we wouldn't die but have eternal life. One more thing I want to do with you before we receive it. Uh, see if you can answer this question. What do these following countries have in common? What do these following countries have in common? And I'm going to give different continents, places. So we'll start with Africa. Places in Africa, Angola, Burundi, Cameroon, Congo, Cote de l'Ivoire, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Egypt, Ethiopia, Ghana, Kenya, Liberia, Mozambique, Rwanda, South Africa, South Sudan, Swaziland, Tanzania, Togo, Tunisia, Zimbabwe. So places in Asia, what do they have in in common with these places in Africa. Bangladesh, Cambodia, China, Hong Kong, India, Indonesia, Japan, Okinawa, Laos, Macau, Malaysia, Myanmar, Nepal, North and South Korea, the Philippines, Singapore, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Vietnam. So places in the Caribbean, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Jamaica, in Central America, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Panama. A few places in Europe. What do they have to do with all of these other places I mentioned? Bulgaria, Croatia, Cyprus, Czech Republic, Estonia, 
France, Hungary, Italy, Netherlands, Norway, Poland, Republic of Georgia, Romania, Russia, Siberia, Spain, Ukraine, United Kingdom, or in the Middle East, Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, in North America, Mexico, in South America, Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Peru. What do they all have in common? Christian missions, more specifically, American Baptist missions. There is an American Baptist witness in every one of those locations, or there has been in the past 12 months. Okay? We're a little piece of the body of Christ, American Baptist. 5,500 congregations in the United States. Because you notice I didn't mention the United States. So what we're talking about is where else besides the United States are we witnessing to the name of Jesus Christ? You just heard a list of places where we have a witness. Now, that's just American Baptist. Now think everybody else. All the other Christians and all the mission work that they do and go throughout the rest of the world. Today, all of us sit down at the table and partake of the body of Christ together. I have all kinds of stories about what American Baptist missions are doing. And this month, by the way, is World Mission Offering. That's just a side note. In the next couple of weeks, you can give to that to help support all of those people out in all of those places. But today, I'm just sharing that with you to just give you a sense that we're not the center of Christianity right here in this room. But we are an important part of the body of Christ. God has called us together to the story. Now, I said that I would share with you my view of why those things, those elements are out there. The, in here. Uh, and again, you think about, come back to thinking about why you think it's out there. I'm not going to tell you the right reason, I'm going to tell you my reason. Your, your, again, your reason might be better. So you, when you go out there, you take whatever works for you. Uh, and I'd ask that while you do go out and partake today, um, that you pray the missionaries in those places that I mentioned. That the word Christ we proclaim even as we proclaim it until he comes while we can take this away. and if you're unable if it's difficult for you to walk back there we will bring the elements to you as well as we um, and here's how it's going to work before I tell you why is that we'll start down here in the front and I'll let this mission row by row and you'll go back and you'll partake and you'll go whichever side you're on partake of the bread then the cup and there'll be a place to that's what you're telling. You come back down the sides and back into your house. Back to the same. We'll do that right now. Here's the why. It's worldwide for you to suffer. I want you to get out of our Christian bubble. I want you to get out of the sanctuary. I want you to go into the world. I want you to take of communion in the world. We always take it in here, in the holy, holy place, in the sanctuary. But I want you to go out of the sanctuary so that you understand you are partaking of it with others, with others throughout the world. And not only that, you are going as a witness. You are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes, not here, but in the world. It's, well, I wouldn't even say it's easy to proclaim it here because some people even have trouble talking about Jesus in church. But by this, we're saying we're, we're proclaiming Jesus in the world. For me, that's why it's it is. And I can tell you, in those 39 years, I don't remember ever doing it like that. Let's pray and then receive communion. And if you're, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, um, we just ask that for the flow of things, you just walk with the rest of us and you would just uh, put your hand up that you, you're not receiving it today. And that's why we're glad you're here. It's not ours, it's the Lord's table. Here is Father, our peace we pray for you for our on. Father God, thank you for the bread and the cup. Thank you for blessing the people who are going to participate in this. We often will say, bless the elements, Lord, but it's not the elements. It's the people. It's the heart and the soul. It's the forgiveness that's taking place. Lord, may every person know that when they go by, they're thinking about missionaries throughout the world, they're thinking about proclaiming your death, that they also think about, God, forgive me of my sin. 
cleanse me of all unrighteousness. So God, when we walk back into the sanctuary, walk back into this holy uh, assemblage, we walk back in clean, refreshed, renewed, all sin washed away. No more because your word proclaims that Jesus is faithful and just. And that when we confess our sin, he will forgive us. We thank you that it's taking place at this very moment. In Christ's name, amen. Let us receive the Lord's Supper.
those who spread the good news. How beautiful are the feet of those of our Savior, Jesus Christ. How Thank you. 
fast, or even dream of infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, and hopes. Now glory be to God through the church, his body, and through Jesus Christ throughout all generations, both now and forever. And the body of Christ said,